It's a golden year once again, and joining us today is Jason Donovan. Hello. Hello. How Ken. are you? Oh, very good. Well, the better for seeing your face on, well, not in a uh, a bus going from you know <laughs> Glasgow or Edinburgh yeah. terminal to a plane. Yeah, as we, we last saw each other. That was where we uh, yes. last met. <laughs> I think we hugged. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> uh, much to the amusement of everybody on the yeah, bus. That's yeah, true. <laughs> a that's true. Airport bus. There it's, we are. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. lovely to see you, and yeah, and 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 hear greatest hits. Fantastic. Yeah, a nicer place altogether. Nice. Yes. Golden. And golden. That's the thing. We have a golden year in yes. a golden studio. And the year for you is 1989, mm. I believe. So mm. why, of all the great years you must have had, why 1989? Well, look, I mean, I, I don't always, bring, you know, those things on the internet these days with Instagram, they're all ph philosophical, don't always look back. But, you know, one can't ignore, you know, um, uh, how significant that moment was for me. I guess sort of coming out of Neighbours, uh, I must have been, George, let me do the maths here, what, 20, uh, no, I wasn't 20, 18, oh, God, what's my, <laughs> 1968 I was born. Uh, 22. 22. No, 21. 21. 21. That's right, because I remember my 21st birthday in Melbourne, uh, which is another reason to celebrate 1989, a very auspicious date in anyone's calendar. Um yeah, I mean, it, it seemed to just be a magic moment where obviously my music career with Stock Aiken Waterman, uh, I decided to leave Neighbours, I wasn't quite sure of the future, uh, and then I had this massive album and life began again. Yeah. Uh, like a War of the Worlds, you know, <laughs> lyric. <laughs> Life begins again. But it's a big step mm. to leave Neighbours mm. because it was a massive success. Sure. Uh, and you were acting in that and well-known right around the world. Yeah. But to, to leave and have no kind of safety net yeah. must have been quite a step for you. Yeah, I mean, it was. And youth, you know, um, you think is sort of anything is possible when you're, you're young. Um, but at the same time, the security of, you know, something like Neighbours, I could have been there 36 years later. I could still be there um, for all intense purposes. Well, well, but but I probably, I probably, <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's another story. I, um, look, I, I think, y you know, you, you make these judgments based on a certain amount of education. And we sort of knew that, that, that I knew that there was opportunity ahead. Um, and I'd done a mini series for Channel 10, which is a, an Australian TV series that was quite successful. So I knew that even if maybe my music career didn't go off that that I could follow an acting career. And in fact, I turned down a number of acting roles because I just got obsessed by music and yeah. wanting to become a pop star, you know, which I sort of managed to oh. tick a box quite successfully. I, th yeah. I think so. Yeah. Uh, and the meetings with Stock Aiken, mm. Waterman, you know, that just propelled you, didn't it? Yeah, yeah they began in 88, yeah. um, you know, and, and I, I, I won't lie, and it's quite well uh, documented that... Uh, that all began really with Kylie's sort of success. I mean, my father is an actor and yep. he's always said to me, you need to be as versatile as one you possibly can. And music and, and acting are sort of interlinked in, you know, a number of ways. Um, but I didn't quite anticipate what those meetings in 1988 would lead to. I did a, a demo for Pete Waterman in the old Kent Road in... Um, with a guy called Phil Hammond, I think it was, in, in 87, maybe, 87, 88. And then, of course, recording Especially For You, which went to number one uh, in the summer, of the, sorry, the Christmas of 1988. And then subsequently, Too Many Broken Hearts, which was sort of my breakthrough yeah. solo moment, yeah. sort of mid-1989. Not bad. And, of course, the following mm. year, 1990, mm. you had that massive tour. Yes, doing fine. Yeah. Nice. Well, yes, and, and, and live, you know. And thank you for, for bringing that uh, to my attention again because we're going back out in 2025. Very excited about that. Uh, 35 years since that tour. Um, and in a way, it's a sort of a catchphrase, doing fine. At the time, it was one of the singles I released from my second album with Stock Aitken Waterman in 1990. But going back to what, what I'm saying to you is the craft. It's always been about the craft to me. And, and you know, um, you talk about me, Jason Donovan, quite known and quite famous. And fame is really a byproduct of what I did and what I still do, which is my passion for performing. 
So for us, working with someone like Stockache and Waterman obviously meant it was quite slick and well-produced and, you know, people talk about the factory. To me, it was really important to get stuck in and, and play live, even if at the time um, that music wasn't really being played live too much. It was, you know, the new frontier of um, popular dance music as such, you know, in a commercial sort of sense. Well, let's get on to the music that you've chosen from 1989. First of all, we've got uh, Nina Cherry with mm. Buffalo Stance. Why that one? Oh, I mean, what a tune. You know what I mean? It's one of those songs, and I remember her on Top of the Pops, one of the few times that I was, well, one of the many times I was on, um, and she was pregnant, I think, at the time, and she had those big, massive um, uh, uh, sneakers, you know, and with the, the gold sort of, um, you know, chain around her neck. But just a punchy, great pop hit, Buffalo Stance, you know. I mean, it's just in your face. But it's, you know, it's, it's, it's up there with the, 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 you know, the girl power in a way, a big time, you yep. know. Uh, just uh, thinking about your your career, mm. you're much more known these days for theatre yeah. and musical theatre, yeah. but all types of theatre, uh, and you obviously get a big kick out of being yeah. on stage. Well, uh, look, I, I, musical theatre sort of came to me by default, really, and I guess leading you know two years beyond 1989 was 1991, and 1991 was obviously Joseph, and and it was a combination of the two things I thought I was reasonably good at, at the time, which is. Um, you know, singing and acting. I mean, primarily acting, I suppose, at that point in my, my life. Yeah, I, I guess, you know, it, it's been a conscious decision over the years. I've, I've tried numerous, I'll be honest, again, I've tried numerous times to reinvent myself as a sort of a pop artist, but, but working being a songwriter and drawing songs is, is very time-consuming and one has to be very dedicated and... You know, I just really got swept up in the business of going out there and just working and creating these roles. And musical theatre just seemed to, seemed to seem to sit really well for me. Rocky Horror, 1998, Priscilla, 2011, Joseph, obviously, 1991. Uh, there's been a few moments with me where I've gone, yeah, this is sort of, you know, this is... A, but aged with me in yeah. a way it has. I could have spent 20 years writing, you know, the next pop classic that could have disappeared in, you know, a weekend. So I sort of made a, a, a choice, you know, in the last sort of decade and a half that yeah. I'd, I'd keep on to my musical theatre roots. But it's hard work and you've got to be very mm, disciplined yeah. and, and obviously yeah. you are. You're yeah. keeping healthy and fit and working hard. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's been, you're going to be an athlete to be uh, what what I do. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm very conscious of mental health and physical fitness. I think they go hand in hand. Um, I'm still here, Ken, doing it, you know, and, um, you know, I feel very grateful. I mean, I've always said you create your own luck in life, but timing is everything. You yeah. know, we, 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 we're, we run by a clock. The world is round. It's not square, you know. Um, so we're always, you know, moving in a circle in some sort of ways. So, um, and 1989, going back to, to the year, was for me sort of almost perfect timing. Yep. Tears for Fears, another song from that year, Woman in Chains. Mm. Well, I think it's Alita Adams. Would I be right? And you're my, is, right. Yep. is that right? Yep. Um, and I just, it's just one of those haunting, spacious, gorgeous songs. So uh, mm. the next one is In Excess mm. and Mystify. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, there's a lot of history <laughs> between uh, um, In Excess and, and, and me, in a good way, in a good way. We, uh, I saw In Excess when they were at the peak of their powers and their last night in Sydney Entertainment Centre with the kick uh, tour and was absolutely blown away. I mean, look, there's a lot of Michael Hutchins I wish I could have been, you know, that lead singer of a, a band, an Aussie band, sort of, you know, quite feminine in a way, Michael, you know, very charismatic on stage and just had that ballsy sort of big voice but a little bit of funk with their yeah. music. Yeah. And and Kick was just, if you know as an Australian, it, it wasn't... 
just that moment. Uh, NXS had a massive catalogue of uh, albums prior to Kick that were huge. Uh, Listen Like Thieves, uh, Shabu Shabar in Australia. Big, big albums, big songs. But Mystify is just one of those beautiful, simplistic, haunting Andrew Farris, Michael Hutchins at their best. And Black Box, Ride on Time is next pop music at its best you know it's just and this is what i love about pop music it's just classic it brings you in um and it just when you're in the right or you listen to the radio all those years back and it just I, I used to have two pluggers called ron and robert at the time um sharp end you, you might have yeah, heard of them yeah, 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 yeah. um you know and and i think we were even challenging black box with one of the and, of course, Stock Ake and Waterman at that time were massive in the charts, but this song you just couldn't go near. I mean, it just was untouchable. Um, I'm sure they had a lot of interesting arrangements about who sings vocals and who doesn't, um, but, uh, you know, it's just a great, great classic pop record that still sounds good today. So it does. Black Box, Ride on Time, 1989, Jason Donovan's Golden Year. One more. It's Donna Summer. This time I know it's for real. I think um, Stock Ake and Waterman were one of the, the, the greatest melody writers of a generation. You know, Mike Stock particularly knew how to carve a wonderful melody. And if you listen to um, songsmiths, that, they will say that's the key to a, a great yeah. song. Chord structures, uh, as we know through Ed Sheeran's recent issues in, in America with, with court cases, you know, chord structures pretty much stay the same. It's the, how would you call it, a melod- melody yeah, smith? Yeah, the melody line. Yeah, yeah, yeah always yeah. has to change. And and this is just one of those songs, I'll be, I'll be honest with you, that I wish I had from, from the top of their cassette cupboard. You know, one of those ideas. Although Stock Ake and Waterman didn't work like that. Stock, <clears throat> Although Stock Ake and Waterman didn't work like that, they, they tended to create their songs on the day. So yeah. there was no such thing as when you'd go to publishers back in the day saying, I want your song from the top of the shelf, I want your best song. They were just working at it and they worked towards the artists themselves and I think they knew with Donna Summer that they had to come up with an absolute smash and yeah. this is one of those tunes. And they worked, to, as you said, towards the artists. Mm. They, they wrote songs that suited mm. you as yes. an artist. Yeah, which, you know, I think Too Many Broken Hearts was one of those songs, you know, and I think what they did with Rick and... I mean, you know, Kylie's better the devil you know. Um, And I guess, you know, it's, you know, I guess in a way, Stock Ake and Morden were underrated. I think the production values of their songs probably haven't stood the test of time as much as the melodies, but but still as a a catalogue of songs, I mean, you know, you can't. You can't mess with, with, with that currency. No, indeed. We'll play it in a moment. But uh, let's just think briefly about uh, doing Fine 25, which we've uh, already talked about. Mm. It's a, a fair distance away mm. at this point in time, so you have, you're obviously a forward planner. I am. But it's, yeah. a, it's a big, big tour, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Well, we, we um, you know, it goes back to my world tour in 1990. Um, and I'll be honest with you, I haven't really um, uh, you know, drafted the landscape of the show, but I, you know, I just want to go back to the optimism um, and you know the spirit of that time. I think um, you know there's a lot of tracks in my catalogue and through my theatre career that I haven't uh, used in in tours I've done in the past. I really enjoy. It. Um, uh, touring live and I enjoy the connection the emotional connection I think between an audience um, and, and a performer and I feel comfortable um, with my personality at my age of 55 enough to be able to give these sort of shows so I feel like I'm in a good place and I'm doing fine you know so it just it just sort of came off the tongue this this um, this tour in a way and and I mean it's a bit of a distance away, but be careful because time will 
move on. And before you know it, it'll be January 2025. And you never know what can happen in a year, Ken. That's so true. Yep. So true. And you've given us something to look forward to <laughs> as well. Yeah. Something to think about. Oh, oh it's it's something for a whole of things. A bit of philosophical there at the end. You give us everything. Yeah. Fantastic. A bit of personality is oh, what we love, want. We love a bit of that. Mm. Yeah. Jason, a pleasure to see you.